Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Williams. I'm the president of the Claremont Institute. Uh, I assumed this role on September 1st, uh, but I've been with Claremont since uh, 2005. I wanted to thank you all for coming this evening uh, to discuss this very important topic. Before we get to our official programming, I thought I would say just a bit quickly about what Claremont does uh, and why we do it. So let me start big. The mission of the Claremont Institute is to save Western civilization. <clears throat> We've always aimed high. Yeah. We've been for some time, we think, at a turning point. We will either once again recover the principles that made us great and the statesmanship attendant to those principles, or we'll sink into moral and intellectual decline, defeat, uh, and confusion. Our longtime distinguished fellow, Harry Jaffa, outlined the problem like this. The crisis of the West today can only truly be met and resolved by America. It is only in America, animated by the laws of nature and nature's God, that will sustain and restore a government of civil and religious liberty against the modern forces of despotism. And in America, because of our long-standing political and intellectual landscape, the crisis can only be met and resolved on the so-called political right. But if the right is to have any chance, conservatism has to lead the way. And the only way conservatism can do this is if it returns to the principles of the American founding and their noble and intelligent defense by the great statesmen uh, in our political history. Now that's an old and peculiar word, statesman. Not much in use today. Certainly not much exemplified today. But it's essential. I think in our tendency today, especially on the right, uh, we tend to confuse policies with principles. In a way, defining statesmanship is easy. Do the most good and the least harm given the circumstances. The difficulty is, of course, knowing what the good is and how to get there. It's our good fortune that we have wonderful examples to draw from. Washington, Lincoln, Churchill, Reagan, all good places to start. And we should return to the principles of the American founding not because they're ours, or not merely because they're ours, not because they're old, but also because they are true and the necessary basis for a good, happy, peaceful nation. Our work at Claremont is not just the study of these things, as great a task as that is. More broadly, we're engaged, what, we're engaged in what Jaffa called the scholarship of the politics of freedom. So what is our strategy? How do we restore America's principles and save the West? Well, we teach, we write and promote high-minded and public-spirited scholarship, we engage the great issues of public affairs and statesmanship by helping leaders to apply principles to politics and policy. We teach in our four fellowship programs, the newest of which is underway right now for speechwriters working here in Washington, D.C. We support, help publish, and promote books about constitutionalism, limited government, and the most important issues facing our country. We write in our Claremont Review of Books, edited by my colleague Charles Kessler. The CRB, as it's affectionately known to many of you here, is a magazine that engages the battle of ideas with seriousness and a view to the most important political questions. Our Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence under John Eastman's leadership helps to steer judges and their clerks to the correct and principled re reasoning in the most important and consequential cases. And finally, we have now over 650 fellowship alumni working in leading positions in politics, media, and opinion-shaping institutions in Washington, D.C., Texas, California, New York, and around the country. We continue to educate them, engage them, and learn from them about the political and policy changes and challenges that they see day to day, and we collaborate with them in the project of restoring constitutional government. Indeed, on Saturday, we will host a, an alumni retreat in Georgetown. The programming will be a master class on Claremont senior fellow Tom West's new book, The Moral Condition, or sorry, P The Political Theory of the American Founding, Natural Rights, Public Policy, and the Moral Conditions of Freedom. I encourage you all to pick up a copy if you have not done so already. Uh, many of our alumni are here tonight, so if I may, would you all just please stand so that we can recognize your uh, public spirit and dedication and thank you for it. Thank you. I, I didn't warn any of you about that, so I appreciate it. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you here how urgent this question of education is. 
with the higher education establishment increasingly in thrall to identity politics, star chamber proceedings, and the violent suppression of speech. The need for serious and compelling alternatives has never been greater. With this state of affairs and with a national political scene that seems to be increasingly in a state of great disruption, part of our, a uh, large part of our topic today, we have big plans at the Claremont Institute to expand our project of scholarship and its application to help current and future policymakers, judges, opinion leaders find their way with a firm grounding in American political principles and justice rightly understood. Policy changes day to day, but our goal must always be the restoration of the equal protection of equal individual, equal individual rights, not group rights. So this is a big task to be sure. Uh, we'll have to undertake it with many partners as we always have, not on our own. It's the most important work we can be doing. Uh, it's work to, wi to which my colleagues and I have dedicated our careers and our, our lives. And it's work really we shoulder in good spirit and with camaraderie and friendship. So uh, I wanna thank you all for your friendship and partnership in this project. And again, thank you for joining us here this evening. Now, let's get down to business. We're here to talk about the resistance and the rise of the violent left. I'll introduce our four panelists. They'll speak in that order for about 10 to 12 minutes each, and then we'll have time for discussion and questions. William Vogley is a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute, a senior editor of the Claremont Review of Books, the author of two books, Never Enough, America's Limitless Welfare State, and The Pity Party, a mean-spirited diatribe against liberal compassion. Uh, it's a great title. Uh, Bill writes an essay for every issue of the CRB, and I encourage you to seek them out at claremont.org slash CRB if you're not familiar with them. Uh, Bill is a master of synthesis, uh, has a wry sense of humor, and is a skilled writer. Uh, and you're always, you will always profit by reading Bill. Michael Walsh is a journalist, author, and screenwriter. He spent 16 years as the music critic of Time Magazine. His works include the novels As Time Goes By and All the Saints, which was the winner of the 2004 American Book Award for Fiction, and the Devlin series of thrillers. He's also the author of the recent nonfiction bestseller, The Devil's Pleasure Palace, The Cult of Critical Theory, and also its forthcoming sequel, Fiery Angel, another good subtitle, Art, Culture, Sex, Politics, and the Struggle for the Soul of the West. Henry Olson is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where his work focuses on how to address the electoral challenges facing modern American conservatism. This work is the basis of his new excellent book, I recommend it to you all, The Working Class Republican, Ronald Reagan and the Return of Blue Collar Conservatism, published in June. Henry's work has demonstrated remarkable accuracy in prediction. Uh, his election eve predictions in this last cycle uh, were more accurate than those of virtually any other major commentator or analyst. Finally, and last certainly but not least, Angelo Cotavilla is a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute, a professor emeritus of international relations at Boston University. He served as a U.S. Navy officer, a foreign service officer, and professional staff member of the Select Committee on Intelligence in the Senate. He's a prolific writer. His work appears frequently in the Claremont Review of Books, The Federalist, American Greatness, uh, and most notably, I think, for the sake of tonight's discussion, I refer you all to his 2017 spring essay, The Cold Civil War. With that, I welcome Bill Vogley to the podium. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, very nice to be here. Before I tell you what I think about tonight's topic, let me tell you what I think tonight's topic is. It seems to me we're talking about the precariousness of liberal democracy. When protesters and hecklers made it impossible for Charles Murray to deliver a lecture at Middlebury College this year, they conveyed several ideas. One, his free speech rights deserve no respect. Two, the Middlebury students who followed the college's formal processes for inviting guest speakers can have their actions informally nullified if other students strongly oppose a particular invitation. And three, the decisions about the recognition of rights and the processes of self-government 
are best settled by those who, in Yeats' words, are full of passionate intensity. According to one Middlebury sociology professor who wrote extensively in defense of the anti-Murray protesters, debate is important, but the acceptable range for debate is between anti-racists and non-racists. Racists can and should be excluded, which means that the people who decide which thoughts and thinkers are worthy of debate and which ones are unworthy are going to wield enormous power. If we end up running a country rather than just a college along these lines, we will have repudiated the idea that government exists to secure certain inalienable rights and derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. This sense that liberal democracy's future is never assured is not new. It pervades the Federalist Papers, for example. But it was in abeyance for a while at the end of the Cold War when intelligent people entertained the idea that we were at the end of history. Now, specifically, Francis Fukuyama wrote in 1989 that we might be witnessing the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Fukuyama's thesis was widely mischaracterized as triumphalist. In fact, he went so far as to specify that the end of history would be a sad time. His argument, as I read it, was not so much that liberal democracy was magnificent and irresistible as that humans had run out of alternatives to liberal democracy. None had succeeded, and there was no good reason to expect some new alternative would fare any better. The hard quarter century since the demise of the Soviet Union has disabused us of the idea that liberal democracy will go from strength to strength, whether people are committed to it or merely resigned to it. Among the chastened is Fukuyama, who worried earlier this year about democracies turning on themselves and undermining their own legitimacy. Why? is liberal democracy inherently precarious. James Madison's famous answer was faction, and his famous definition of it was a number of citizens united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Based on what we've learned in the 230 years since the Federalist Papers, we can update Madison a bit to say that liberal democracy is simple but not easy. The central ideas are plain. According to the Declaration of the Rights of Man, for example, adopted by the National Assembly of France in 1789, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits except those which assure to the other members of the society the enjoyment of the same rights. The nobility of this sentiment and Euclidean simplicity of this principle did nothing to prevent the French from erecting, uh, protect, prevent the French from erecting guillotines four years later. Those united by a passion or interest inimical to others' rights or the community's best interest may favor the reciprocity of liberal democracy in general, in the abstract. It's just that they find liberal democracy intolerable when it prevents them from following a particular course of action they consider morally imperative. Seen in this light, liberal democracy is weak because the case for it is largely procedural. Liberal Democrats are those whose highest concern is that the game be played in strict adherence to a fair set of rules. People join teams in interpolitical contests out of the desire for particular outcomes, however, not due to some enthusiasm for a set of processes. No one ever bought a ticket to a game in order to see the star referee. This procedural case for liberal democracy can be fortified by self-interest well understood, which is a practical consideration. P 
people who find playing by the rules frustrating might adhere to the rules anyway if they think that they are an inconvenience today that might be valuable to their cause at some point in the future. Liberals who plead with campus protesters not to shout down guest speakers often make this argument. Left-wing views are especially likely to be unpopular, they say, which is why everyone on the left should uphold categorically the rights to free speech and expression. Unfortunately, self-interest well understood gets us only so far. The findings of historians, anthropologists, and psychologists do more to discourage than encourage the belief that humans can be relied on to discern and follow their long-term interests. A faction united by an impulse is especially likely to be impulsive and to ignore advice to think it over and take the long view. There are two additional reasons why self-interest well understood is unlikely to make activists like those at Middlebury College change their minds. First, people on the near and far left have been telling one another for years now that they're on the right side of history. Sometimes this means something hazy and uplifting about how the moral force of social justice guarantees its ultimate victory. Sometimes it means something more specific a majority-minority America will arrive by the middle of this century, bringing to a close the long, hateful centuries of straight white males' hegemony. However one interprets it, being on the right side of history means that self-interest well understood isn't much of a constraint. Madison's theory about the multiplicity of factions in an extended republic was that people would restrain themselves during those fleeting moments when they were in the majority to avoid setting precedents that would threaten them when they were in the minority. But if you think it's only a matter of time before you're always in the majority, on top of which you believe your cause is blessed by the mandate of heaven, history with a capital H, then the distinction between being passionate and being prudent collapses. The impulsive and heedless are furthering the cause of social justice, not undermining it. Fortune favors the bold, who are not only on the right side of history, but hasten the arrival of the better future that is our right and destiny. Secondly, social justice warriors not only disregard, but disdain the liberal democratic rule book. Social justice rests on anti-foundationalism, defined by historian James Kloppenberg as the denial of universal principles, such as the existence of inalienable natural rights, in favor of the belief that all human creatures, all human cultures are human constructions. constructions. No social arrangements, including liberal democracy, as a result, have any metaphysical grounding or primacy. In this view of things, liberal democracy's rules are arbitrary and rigged in favor of certain groups. As such, they deserve contempt, not respect. Even if you don't pick my pocket or break my leg, you harm me if you hurt my feelings, especially if you do so in a way that diminishes my sense of self-worth by reinforcing existing status and power disparities. According to an open letter to the Whitney Museum, protesting a painting of Emmett Till by a white artist. I'm quoting, white free speech and white creative freedom have been founded on the constraint of others and are not natural rights. The letter called for the painting to be taken down and destroyed. In this sense, the social justice project reverses the famous Clausewitz dictum. Politics becomes war carried out by other means. There are no countrymen, there is no polity, nor is there a constitution or fundamental principles. There are only interests and the power to pursue them. The only rule is that it is better to be strong than to be weak. Not only is liberal democracy inherently precarious, but those who want to preserve it in the present historical circumstances 
will find it necessary to vindicate not just liberal democracy, but politics itself. Thank you. It's a real honor and <clears throat> pleasure for me to be here today with this <clears throat> distinguished group of fellow panelists and all of you in the audience. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Michael Walsh. As Ryan has told you, uh, <clears throat> I came to politics rather late. I was a pianist and a music student at the Eastman School of Music. Uh, I mean, it's not so much where I was, but when I was, and I was there at 1967. So my college years went from 1967 to 71, which, as you may recall, included all the fun things, including the Chicago riots of 1968, the Christmas bombing of Hanoi, uh, and it wrapped up in May of 70 with Kent State shooting. So it was quite a time to be a college student, and uh, I, although I didn't particularly enjoy the experience, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. Later in life, I was working for Time Magazine as not only a, a music critic, but a foreign correspondent. And I was in uh, the Soviet Union when Chernobyl blew up. I was in Berlin when the wall came down, and I was in Moscow during the coup against Gorbachev. So as you can see, something exciting will probably happen right here at any <laughs> minute. Uh, I also go by the names Zelig and Forrest Gump. <laughs> the 60s was a, a, a time that I think is really important. I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about the 60s because this is where all of this starts. This is where Antifa comes from. This is where cultural Marxism comes from uh, in, in its most explicit form. In, in my most recent book, The Devil's Pleasure Palace, it's all about cultural Marxism. It's about the Frankfurt School of Philosophers who brought it to the United States in the 60s. Herbert Marcuse, for example, being the most well-known in, in the uh, U.S. because he stayed here for such a long time. Uh, it is the founding of all of our political problems, and I'm going to address those in a little something I'm going to read to you in a minute. Uh, I was fascinated uh, by, by a couple of things. Ryan mentioned the mission of the Claremont Institute is the restoration of Western civilization and Western culture. When I wrote Devil's Pleasure Palace, I had no idea that two years later, with the new book, The Fiery Angel, about to come out, the very notion of defending our heritage would be racist. As you know, Western civilization is now racist. This tells you something important about the cultural Marxists, which is they are feeling victory. They are sensing it. Uh, they get increasingly violent as they get closer to what they feel their goal is. And as you all know, I don't have to convince you that the end point of every socialist, fascist, because they're the same thing, yes, Hitler was a national socialist, unless he was lying to you. He was a socialist. Their end state is always forcing you into the gulag or the death camp at the point of a gun. It is always that way. Do not fall for their good intentions, they're liars. So I cannot make this point too succinctly or strongly. Uh, I believe these people to have no honor and no principles other than the will to power. They are Nietzschean in the most fundamental sense. So with that cheery introduction, I thought I'd read something uh, that I like to call the Cold Civil War. I, I know uh, Angelo has written one, but I wrote this back in 2010 as part of my book called Rules for Radical Conservatives, which I wrote under my then pen name of David Kahane when I was at National Review. David Kahane, to set this up, is a 35-year-old lefty Marxist red diaper baby screenwriter in Hollywood whose father is the sainted Che Kahane. And his uncle is, of course, named Joe, as in Uncle Joe Stalin. And uh, I wrote the Kahane character as a parody of every leftist uh, person that I've ever met in my entire life. And many people thought it was real, so they'd write into 
Rich Lowry and others at National Review saying, what are you doing with this leftist right? William F. Buckley be turning over Which just proves that our side has no sense of humor either. Uh, so I wrote uh, this whole book in the voice of David Kane. So, oh, he has a girlfriend. She's a former porn star named Ginger. And uh, she spends a lot of time with the pool boy whose name is Juan Tomas because he was mother was a fan of Lady Chatterley's lover. So uh, somehow Dave never notices any of these things going on at Shea Kahane, which is located in the beautiful Los Angeles neighborhood of Echo Park. And he always talks about his magnificent mansion in Echo Park. And I lived in Echo Park. I love Echo Park. It's sort of the, it's like the equivalent of Union Square in New York, where all the commies lived back in the 20s and 30s. It's great, but there are no mansions in Echo Park. It's very poor, and, and uh, uh, occasionally one used to hear gunshots when I lived in the neighborhood. Uh, so Dave Kahane is writing this from his mansion in Echo Park, and it's called the Cold Civil War. Despite all the evidence of the past several decades, you still have not grasped one simple fact, that just about a century after the last one ended, we are engaged in a great civil war. Dave likes to quote people like Lincoln, you know. One that will determine the kind of country we and our descendants shall henceforth live in for at least the next 100 years, and hopefully 1,000 years, yeah. Since there hasn't been any shooting so far, some call the struggle we are now involved in the culture wars, but I have another better name for it, the Cold Civil War. In many ways, this new civil war is really an intergenerational struggle, and I think this is a point I want you to keep in mind as, we, as I... Uh, speak to you today. The war of the baby boomers. This is a war of my generation. I just turned 68 years old two days ago, and so I am sort of smack in the, the front middle of the baby boomer generation. And until we are all gone, you will have no justice and no peace, because <laughs> this fight will go on forever. When you're four years old and you report to kindergarten and there are 75 other kids in the class, you already have a view of the world that is going to color your experience for the rest of your life. America's largest generation, the famous pig in the python, has affected everything it's touched. You, you silly conservative, ditwit, right-wing fascist Nazis, admired strength, resolve, and pur purposefulness. We were stuck with weakness and indecision. You saw the world as something to be conquered. We saw the world as a hostile force needing to be appeased. You dealt with life head on, never complaining and never explaining. We ran home and told our mommies. Think of us as Cain to your Abel, hating you from practically the moment we were born, hating you for your excellence and for your unabashed pursuit thereof while we were the ugly stepchildren. Well, Cinderfella, how do you like us now? Today we are the cock of the walk, king of the world, our vices made virtues, and all us sinners, saints, while you are out trying to make your way in the world, earning a living, being responsible, raising a family, paying your taxes, we infiltrated your every institution, the schools, the law, Hollywood, the culture, the government. We learned, this is before the Obama administration now, mind you, we learned to train your own weapons upon you, and while you weren't looking, we shot you in the back with them. And so it was the cold civil war moved to the trenches with the last battle of the shooting war, which came at Kent State in May of 1970. I've made this point before. Those of us who were there uh, understand that the student protests effectively ended with Kent State. What lessons we can learn from this, I will leave up to you. But the, the great, uh, the, the riots at the Chicago Convention in 68, the Days of Rage in 69, all came to a halt in uh, 1970, in May of 1970. And then the left decided they didn't like getting shot and they went back underground until now when they reemerged as Antifa. A little bit of history about that Kent State thing. If you recall, there was a series of days of, of rioting leading up to the actual shooting and the National Guard was called in. And finally, on Monday, May 4th, a mass rally was held. The administration tried to cancel it to no avail. The Guard tried to break it up. They fired tear gas, but the wind blew it away. The cry went up, pigs off campus. The kids threw rocks and empty tear gas canisters 
And then the guard fired back, not with rocks, but with real live bullets. In 13 seconds, 67 rounds were fired, and when the shooting stopped, four kids lay dead. And that, my friends, says David to you, was the end of the student protest movement. Really, you have to give us some credit with other movement. What other movement could convince you that the very air you exhale, think about this, the stupidest thing in the world is the CO2 is a contributor to global warming. We all exhale CO2. To say that CO2 is a pollutant says that you are a pollutant. And you must understand they hate you. They want you dead. They're like Al Capone in The Untouchables. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. That's how they think of you. They attack the very most fundamental nature of our physical body and tell us we, we are polluting the world. The very air you exhale is dangerous to the planet and will eventually charge you with attacks for the privilege of not having to hold your breath until you turn blue and die. There I said it, die. I'm going to quote two famous lines from Hollywood now since I spend an awful lot of time there working. And you'll recognize both of them. The purpose of war, says David first, is to kill your enemy. But after Kent State, when it was we who were getting killed, we had to stop fighting up front and out in the open and instead began a gradual process of getting you to kill yourselves. Now, that's what I call a cold war. Probably for the first time in history, one side pins its hopes on winning on the other's gullibility and willingness to believe even the most patently impossible things. Polar bears who can't swim, melting ice caps, seas rising, and that's simply global warming. And it's all your fault, so shut up and die already. It's like that scene in Goldfinger. You all remember Goldfinger, don't you? You all remember one of the most famous scenes in Goldfinger. When Bond, James Bond, is lying there strapped to the table with the laser beam, standing in for the usual buzzsaw, slowly sliding up his legs towards his crotch, and he asks the villain, you expect me to talk? To which Goldfinger replies, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. There is nothing you can talk to me about that I don't already know. Or, if it's a movie closer to your own time and you're after, what about this exchange from Independence Day? Independence Day, by the way, it's the most conservative movie ever made next to High Noon. High Noon was written by a card-carrying communist named Carl Foreman. Independence Day was written by my friend Dee Devlin, who's a Hollywood liberal to the nth degree. And when I say to him, you know, Dean, you wrote the most conservative movie of all time, he just, what? I said, Independence Day. He said, what? I, what? I don't see what you mean. Here's an exchange from Independence Day. You remember the scene in Area 51, an alien has wrapped his tentacles around Brent Spiner's neck so he can communicate with the pitiful earthlings. Here's the dialogue. The president, played by Bill Pullman, of course, playing the Bill Pullman character. Well, what is it that you want us to do? Alien, die. That's negotiation on the left. Well, those two scenes pretty much sum up our attitude vis-a-vis -vis you. And this is the, the final point. Antifa, uh, they're kids in masks, throwing rocks, using any pretext to assault Western society and Western civilizational values, are really the children and grandchildren of my generation, of the baby boomer generation. That this war that's gone on between us, the way we've raised our children, the way they've raised their children, the way we treasure Western civilization, learning, culture, music, uh, if, if you get a chance to read Devil's Pleasure Palace, you will see it's largely about Paradise Lost by Milton and Faust Part Two by Goethe. And the next book will be even harder quiz than the, the first one. I want to support those values. They don't. They want to tear them down. Do we have a way of living amicably with people who wish to destroy our culture and visibly signal it by destroying private property? or public property, for that matter. I don't think that we do, and I think that we have to understand the nature of the enemy. I'll leave with this last thought. In addition to being a effete musical snob like I was, I was also raised by a man who won the Bronze Star for heroism at the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir in 1950 in Korea, 51. Uh, 
And my father is still alive. He's 91 years old. Uh, he was a Marine Corps officer for the full stint and raised me, my brother, and my three sisters all with the values of the Marine Corps. So the first rule of the Marine Corps is finish the fight. Second rule of the Marine Corps is in a fight, your opponent never gets back up off the ground. That's how you fight. We have lost our will to fight an existential threat that the, to the, the extent that the left is by putting them down and putting them down hard. And we have the law on our side, we have tradition on our side, we have right on our side, we have justice on our side. And secondly, uh, I'd like to say just today, uh, I and my business partner, who's also present here tonight, we're up uh, on Capitol Hill talking to the Freedom Caucus, the House Freedom Caucus, and we've announced that we've started a new uh, form of political consultancy, which we're calling cultural and political consultancy. We want to do exactly what you're doing, Ryan. We want to wed the virtues of Western civilization to our political class so that they don't just parrot uh, policies, but principles, and they are fully grounded in these principles, and that then we take what we've learned in Hollywood and in extensive experience in these other fields and make them the most effective candidates they can be. And we hope to be working with some of these guys very soon, and we hope you will see the difference in these candidates because we need leadership that understands what we're fighting for. Because if you don't understand what, you don't fight back. Antifa has challenged you, all of, all of you, everybody in this room, this has challenged us on a civilizational basis, and we must combat them. Thank you very much. Second, a second American Civil War, it seems almost too outlandish to mention. Yet everyone can sense it coming. Our politics are increasingly being drawn into a clear battle between two and only two warring forces. The terms of the battle are not over items that are traditionally negotiable, like how we order our economy. We instead are arguing over the very essence of what it means to be an American we are adopting definitions of American that hold all other definitions to be incompatible and unacceptable. Such debates left unchecked or unmediated invariably lead to the rise of what Tocqueville called great parties for whom the survival of the other is a mortal danger. Such a bipartite hostile division is what led to the frightening civic battles that Thucydides described and which caused the religious wars that our founders took so much pain to avoid ever permitting to happen here. So how are we to avoid such a fate? Ought we to try to avoid such a fate? How, if we do, might we endeavor to do that without sacrificing the ideals that make this conflict even thinkable to begin with? These are the questions that we ought to try to answer. But we can't begin to answer these questions, though, if we don't understand what's being fought over. Only if we know what the partisans of each side are fighting for can we be able to ascertain if we can avoid the fate we are so clearly against? How then do the two warring signs define what it means to be an American? Following the advice of Leo Strauss, I'll try to permit as people might uh, understand themselves rather than try and understand them better. One must first, as he said, understand them as they understood themselves before one tries to understand them as well or better on your own. So those who might call themselves progressives might describe their vision as follows. That in their view, America stands for individual freedom, but that the most essential freedom any person can have is how to choose to live and define what they meet, find to be good. Anything that impedes a person from exercising this most basic freedom is inherently unjust and must be removed. The fact that such barriers might arrive from the private actions or belief of Amer other Americans is not material to that consideration. The question is not whether these people are using law to establish barriers in the face of other Americans. The rather, the question is only if those barriers exist. To the extent they do, they must be removed, regardless of the cost. Neither the nature nor the source of these beliefs or actions is material to the debate as well, they say. 
If the barrier is physical, say the lack of sufficient goods for some to realize their desires, then those who have more goods than they believe are necessary for those people to exercise their own self-directed life shall have the goods taken from them and given in appropriate fashion to those who need them more. The extent that the source of a barrier is a belief long held and revered by many Americans is also immaterial. An unjust belief or practice is unjust and as such must be swept aside. People and peoples who seek to declare themselves Americans, progressives implicitly argue, ought to be welcomed without restriction. Since American national identity's essence is the determination of the good by one's own choice, a simple declaration on behalf of the immigrant of the desire to obey that precept is sufficient to entitle them to America's embrace. There's no inherent just power of the current set of Americans to deny to another potential set of Americans the power of them to exercise their desires. On the other hand, those who might call themselves conservatives or nationalists or populist, it depends on who you speak with, might define themselves as follows. America's promise is the ability of a person to live in accord with human nature. Human nature is inevitably a search for happiness, and happiness is an objective, not a subjective state. While no one can be happy who has not freely chosen the good, and thus it is un-American to compel anyone to follow a conception of the good enshrined in law and enforced by state power. America cannot thrive without laws and institutions dedicated to the proposition of human happiness. America's laws and institutions must therefore seek to unculcate the beliefs and habits necessary for leading a good life. These include a bounded love of self, a moderate degree of concern for the well-being of others, a desire to provide material goods for one's own self and one's own kin before asking for the support of others belief that the opinions of one's neighbors are worthy of respect and of toleration, but not necessarily of approval. They include a belief that the foundation of any society is the attraction of one man to one woman, and that nurturing this bond is essential to the furtherance of the healthy rearing of children who are any society's future. Long-held beliefs and traditions held by large numbers of Americans over time concerning the good and liberty are inextricably linked with American nationality, these people will argue. As such, they maintain a central place in American national identity and their protection and the protection of the institutions, private and public, that abide by those beliefs is essential themselves to American national identity. The current generation of Americans, they will say, retains the right to determine whether others can join their body. While no particular ethnic, religious, or racial background precludes potential membership in the American nation, Americans ought not to be ignorant of the fact that not all beliefs are compatible with good faith participation in American life. This generation of Americans, they say, may act by law to define who may or may not be entitled to reside within or become full members of the American nation. These characterizations are to be sure sweeping and are necessarily imprecise, but do they not depict in their essence the nature of the dispute that threatens to engulf us all? Civil wars can always be avoided by one simple expedient. One side chooses not to fight. The South could have avoided the Civil War following the election of 1860 had it chosen to accept the results. The North could have avoided the Civil War had it chosen to put aside the question of the morality of slavery. The attempt to ignore that question indeed was at the heart of both the Douglas and the Bell campaigns during that election and was at the heart of the so-called Crittenden Compromise that sought to keep the seceding states within the Union between Lincoln's election and his inauguration. Lincoln resisted the temptation to support the Compromise, knowing full well that it could lead to the breakup of his beloved Union. He knew that accepting it would make the Union an empty shell, a tree whose essence had been hollowed out long before it fell and broke asunder. He chose to risk this because the promise of American life was too dear to sacrifice for peace. Our competing ideas today feel similarly. They are unlikely to sacrifice their own beliefs on the altar of peace, no matter how vainly those on the center right and the center left, today's Douglases and Bells, urge them to do so. In that sense, the die is cast. We cannot avoid answering the question. We must decide what it means to be American. I do not believe this conflict will come to open war. Today's large modern militaries make that impossible. But I do believe it could lead to a violence that ultimately leads to the breakup of the American Union. Peoples choose to secede or break a union when they no longer feel they can exercise their highest values freely within it, and we may well be approaching that point. But if that day comes, 
the seceding party is not likely to be the conservative, the nationalist, or the populist. Rather, the fact that the progressives are geographically concentrated in certain parts of America means that it is they who are likely to seek the separation. For if the Clinton vote is a fair representation of progressive strength, even if it exaggerates it, then we should note that all but four Clinton states are contiguous on one of the two coasts. Indeed, combined, the Clinton states produce 52% of America's GDP with only 44% of its population. And their share of GDP is rising as most of the nation's most energetic metropolises are contained within. They are subsidizing the Trump states with their taxes now, and they are not likely to want to continue to do that if their values are not in some way incorporated in American nationality. The patterns of American political demography, however, suggest they will continue to be on the losing side for the foreseeable future. Unless progressive to convince today's equivalent of Douglas's and Bell voters to join their side, their share of the national vote will continue to rise as they continue to gain larger and larger majorities from the states they already control, yet they will continue to lose national elections for the presidency, the Senate, and the House. After a third consecutive presidential defeat in 2024, when a conservative populist coalition has installed a supermajority in the Supreme Court and had a decade to transform the country's policies, even as a clear majority of Americans, an increasing majority of Americans, continue to support some form of progressive politics. What incentive do they have to continue to pay for someone else's values? The Atlantic and Pacific states of America, these two new nations, will immediately become world economic powers. The Pacific states contain the heart of the new digital economy, while the Atlantic states contain the financial capital of the world. Most of America's elite educational institutions are in one of the two, as are the bulk of America's educated citizens. One might mourn their departure, but it's hard to imagine a core of feisty Midwesterners or Southerners going to battle to keep them in the Union. They might even leave, way, gleefully wave bye-bye. I've painted a gloomy picture, but I'm not myself filled with gloom. For there exists another way between the cell of surrender and the charybdis of secession. It's the way of statesmanship. Statesmanship can find a way to make these two sides drop their arms in pursuit of a common definition of American identity. Such an identity is one that recognizes the justice of removing unfair barriers while affirming the objective nature of the good. It's one that embraces the universal nature of the American promise while observing that the habits of citizenship and happiness are just those, habits and that requires time and practice to acquire. It is one that recalls all of us to the better angels of our nature. Such statesmanship can prevail if it can assemble a durable political coalition that obtains the support of a clear majority over time when these issues are the crux of the political debate, as they increasingly are. Each of the dominant pol political coalitions in our history succeeded in this. They might have thereafter lost elections, but the elections they lost were merely disputes about the meaning of the original Baithic orthodoxy that their victory had established. Attempts to relitigate the original question in these times, such as that attempted by Barry Goldwater in 1964 with regards to the post-New Deal coalition, simply reforms and reinstates the original coalition in its strongest form. Conservatives, nationalists, populists, whatever you call us, have the opportunity to form that coalition today. We can unite the Trump voters with Romney voters who voted either for Clinton or for a third party candidate while simultaneously appealing to similarly minded Obama voters. These are today's version of the Douglas or Bell Democrats. We can attract Democrats and independents who do not share the progressive vision or are not wholly convinced of our vision either. These people combined are nearly 60% of America, more than enough once mobilized to prevail time and time again. We can do this, though, only if we distinguish, as Jefferson did after the bitter election of 1800, perhaps the only time that we've resolved such a debate between two great parties peacefully, between our enemies and our adversaries. The hard left, the people that Michael and the people that Bill have talked about, can never be won over. But they obtain power only by attracting people more afraid of our perceived failures than by their vision. As Ronald Reagan wrote after Goldwater's defeat, Time now for the soft sell to prove that our radicalism was an optical illusion. Reagan is the supreme statesman of our age because he was able to create the coalition that redefined American politics for over 30 years. He brought together conservatives, establishment Republicans, and Reagan Democrats, and united them in pursuit of an America that respected tradition and freedom, aggressively but not recklessly fought for American security, 
and which loved freedom while caring for those who needed help to fully participate in American life. That majority that he called the new Republican Party still exists today. We only need to choose to recreate it. This is our calling. This is our rendezvous with destiny. Can we not dedicate ourselves to this cause, to this proposition? Can we not spin it, summit the spirit of the Minutemen who fired the shot heard around the world? Can we not do so, not in the spirit of conquest, but in the spirit of healing, not in the clutches of hate, but with the power of love? The Gipper often used to say, quoting Thomas Paine, that we have it in our power to begin the world again. That we do. And it's time for us to pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor in pursuit of that noble goal. For if not us, who? And if not now, when? Well, it was up to me to, it was left up to me to bat clean up. Uh, so many things that uh, I would like to go into at some length have already been talked about. First, I want to express my, uh, my delight and pride at being at the same table with the author of one of the most enjoyable books I ever read, and that was uh, As Time Goes By. This is the story of what happened after Rick uh, walked off uh, with, uh, with the Frenchman on the tarmac at Casablanca. It is absolutely engrossing, and uh, uh, Michael Walsh, is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, that moment when I read that book uh, convinced me that he was a great author. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Re re read that book. You will enjoy it. Henry Olson talked about uh, the possibility of a kind of secession. I discussed that possibility in the last uh, meeting of this sort as a kind of default, a, a, a benign default outcome uh, of, of our divisions. That possibility, that benign secession, depends, depended largely on <coughs> the willingness of both sides uh, to, to be um, accommodating to the other sides living pretty much as, as they wish in areas where they are a majority. This, of course, was the original bargain which made the uh, American Union possible because no one in 17 uh, 87 had any doubt that uh, of, about the diversity of, of ways of life uh, in, in the colonies and the uh, agreement was that uh, there would be uh, live and let live yeah part of it uh, part of that involved slavery but uh, again the, it was the choice between having a union with slavery and having no union at all and uh, Americans chose to have a union uh, what uh, the, the, the conservative side of American life has always been willing to let the other side live as it wants, uh, but the other side has never been willing to let the uh, conservative side live as it wants. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I believe that the short answer to, uh, to the question as to whether the, our, our cold civil war is going to heat up, uh, our national divisions are going to deepen or not, is that uh, they are going, it is going to heat up, they are going to deepen, and they will do so because the, the things that divide us are intractable. Why are they intractable? Because the, uh, I wish that, uh, that, that Henry Olson's uh, premise were, were, uh, were well founded, that, that is that it is possible for, for all of us <clears throat> to agree on, any, on an objective notion of the good. But it is precisely 
the lack of that ability to consider uh, the, the existence, to merely consider the existence of any objective good. That is the problem. It is that lack which, ca which we, we cannot make it up because it is not up to us to make it up. It is up to, to, uh, to the left to take up something which they have in fact utterly and totally rejected. They rejected it by, uh, because the academy where all of them have, uh, have acquired uh, their minds and hearts has taught them for generations that they are inherently superior to the rest of Americans and that the rest of Americans have no right, no objective right to be who they are and to think as they do. Uh, it, um, uh, and, that it, and that to think otherwise is to grant a kind of false equivalence. That term, you, you, that term should be kept in mind. Uh, President Obama used uh, false equivalence uh, and uh, that term, as I say, is, is uh, common. Um, uh, is common currency in in the universities. I spent most of my life teaching, and I was one of the few people who did not uh, believe that uh, who uh, who in faculty get-togethers uh, argued against the notion of false equivalence. Actually, believing as Leo Strauss taught, as as uh, as a Western tradition th uh, thinks that. Opinions, different opinions, are different attempts to get at an objective truth that none can fully grasp, that no one can, can fully grasp, but that the objective truth exists, the objective, that goodness and evil are not subjective, they are not preferences, but they are in fact um, parts of nature which uh, it is up to us to understand. At any rate, the point here is that uh, uh, Americans in uh, 2008 discovered that most of the, uh, uh, of, of the occupants of the upper reaches of American life uh, uh, are of a similar mind. Uh, and uh, this leaves, this left Americans bereft of any leverage, uh, of, any argue, of any capacity to argue for their own preferences, and left only uh, the, 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 the vote as a weapon for the defense of their way of life. But what can voting do against a compact ruling class that, uh, that, that has all the cards in its hands? And besides, uh, for whom to vote? Uh, the growing realization that the Republican Party was a full is a full partner in that ruling class uh, narrow, certainly narrowed the option. Uh, since 2008, the general electorate has rejected the Democratic Party's rule, has shrunk the Democratic Party's hold on elective offices around the country. Um, meanwhile, however, the ruling class has continued to raise its demands on the rest of the American people. It has become, its demands have become harsher. The Republican Party seemingly has been at war with its own voters. Uh, that's why in November 1916, uh, there was uh, no major constituency in America for any kind of moderation. By, uh, by 2016, uh, most uh, Americans of all persuasions uh, had become accustomed to a country very different from that described in civics books. Uh, the country is no longer run by laws made by elected officials, uh, and uh, rather it is, it is uh, run by administrative agencies. That, uh, uh, you know, we were taught that administrative agencies would uh, exercise quasi-legislative, quasi-executive, and quasi-judicial powers. Drop the quasi. <laughs> These are the rulers. Uh, and, uh, and they are, in fact, uh, ruling on behalf of their own ideologies, and their, which is allied with particular interests. Now, uh, that is why uh, in 2016, Americans on all sides looked for candidates who would set aside niceties and would deliver the results that they sought. But of course, these results were different. The ruling class believed axiomatically that it was on a roll historically and demographically determined. When Hillary Clinton put half of her uh, opponents into a bucket, 
into a basket of deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, you name it, and the other half into a basket of pitiables. Mm -hmm. She was merely explaining her party's unanimous business model. Accusations of sin, uh, claims of virtue, funnel money into ruling class projects. They solidify the ruling class's faction. They push their design to push the deplorables to the margins of society where they can be crushed out of existence, while the money is used to buy the pitiables. Of course, Republican voters were looking for relief from all that. Uh, they rejected piecemeal approach to relief. They wanted their own revolution. Uh, that's why in 2016, uh, there were only two real contenders for the, uh, for the Republican nomination, and these were both anti-establishment, Cruz and Trump. Uh, Trump trumped Cruz by showing himself to be the more passionate revolutionary. Now, Trump uh, did not uh, give many details about what he wanted to do. He simply spoke more harshly against the ruling class as far as uh, policy, he treated pronouncements uh, on policy as flags to be run up or down as he measured the volume of applause. And applause rose proportionate to the pronouncements anti-establishment content. Trump's tone uh, uh, reassured that he knew how to bring back good old America uh, and that it would not take much to do it. The voters, most of whom had never lived in such an America, he did not explain what had made America great in the first place. In fact, Trump had always been an entrepreneur who had sold more sizzle than steak. Uh, he had sold his own brand. He had sold an image. And that is the image that he successfully sold to the country. He was nominated and elected to accomplish revolutions against the ruling class in general and against the Republican Party establishment. His presidency, however, has been uh, certainly uh, uh, one of equivocation. Uh, in policies, Trump has supported, in politics, Trump has supported the Republican establishment, uh, most interestingly uh, in the Alabama primary. This was something that was very, very hard to believe. Why would someone elected uh, against the Republican establishment, in fact, campaign for someone who, one of his pillars, uh, against someone who clearly was not. Uh, it is futile for us to ask why. It is important for us simply to note the fact that this is what happened, and this is a harbinger of what is, of what is going to happen in the future. Trump uh, railed against uh, special interests and, uh, and, and how they are favoring the big over the small, but most recently uh, you saw that, that uh, or perhaps you didn't see, but you should have noted, that he um, uh, reaffirmed the uh, so-called clean energy mandates that fuel, that, that mandate enormous amounts of money to flow from the consumer to the biggest energy firms, excluding the, the, the smaller ones, small, little small business gets crushed, the, the, um, uh, the consumer pays and uh, the only uh, beneficiaries are the biggest businesses. Why is this so? Who knows? And, who, and besides, it's irrelevant. Donald Trump told his uh, on foreign policy, he went on national television and told the, the people that he and they had been wrong, that wiser heads had told him Better. Well, uh, meanwhile, the resistance has uh, convinced itself that it has, th that uh, the wind is blowing in its sails more than ever, and that Trump really is a passing phenomenon. Um, if you, if you want to read the, the, the most fundamental book in that regard, uh, E.J. E. Dion of the Washington Post has just published something like this called America After Trump. It's, an, it's a book which, in fact, uh, 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 foresees 
the, uh, uh, the, the deplorables crushed and the pitiables bought. Uh, uh, it cannot be stressed enough that the resistance expresses the evolving moral and intellectual character of the ruling classes, ruling elements, and hence gives us insight into what the next administration would inflict on America. What would they inflict? Well, uh, also, uh, anybody who thought that uh, the uh, that mandating uh, the access of, of, of men into women's uh, uh, restrooms uh, was the, the ultimate, uh, just uh, imagine that uh, uh, what might uh, be coming next. Uh, the, uh, how far will they go? Well, uh, projects uh, which, uh, of which the ruling class used to speak softly, such as requiring um, uh, doctors, nurses, and hospitals to be trained in, uh, to, to train, uh, uh, be trained in abortions, even Catholic hospitals, uh, that uh, Catholic schools admit uh, homosexual and transgender students, uh, and ens ensuring that online transactions are such as Airbnb comply with evolving anti-discrimination standards. These, uh, that these things, these uh, projects that used to be on the edge, on uh, the ragged edge of, of, of their expectations are, are likely to become uh, uh, the norm. And if you don't agree with them, well, on September 11th of, of, uh, of this year, Congress passed and Trump was persuaded to sign a, a, um, a joint resolution according to which uh, blamed, blames uh, political violence on the political right. And uh, which uh, which urges all who hold power to, in fact, do all they can to crush this new Nazi threat embodied by the political right. Uh, now, uh, the, the left has been trying for many years to equate, first of all, it, the left succeeded in, in uh, uh, introducing into American life the notion of, a, of, of hate crimes, which uh, it understands to be exclusively performable by, by conservatives, and of uh, hate speech. And it is now in the process of translating hate speech into hate crime. And what is hateful speech? Well, it is any speech that the left hates. Uh, I mean, you know, this is, this is perfectly obvious. And so, uh, what can possibly keep them from, uh, from going further with these things? Well, the answer is that um, uh, mere elections so far have not done so. The Im most important thing to, to uh, keep in mind is uh, that uh, the uh, left is confident that deplorables can be crushed, Pitiables can be bought, and that Trump is the ultimate is the ultimate expression uh, of, um, of, of, uh, of of the populist phenomenon. Uh, the point, however, is that whoever becomes president henceforth, whether of the right or the left, is certain to do so as the representative of one side of America antagonistic to the other. The question then arises of how both sides manage their antagonism. Quickly, imagine uh, the uh, a conservative winning in 2020. I'm uh, sorry, a, a, the, uh, the left winning in 2020. It's entirely possible. Uh, the conservative side of American life would try to mount some kind of resistance. But where I, looking at what the Democrats did uh, after to, in 2017. But do you, does anybody think that the, the, a leftist president would treat the resistance as mildly as Donald Trump has, uh, has treated the resistance to him? Donald Trump has reacted to, to the resistance by violent tweets and violent words. 
uh, nobody has had the uh, IRS or the FBI sicked on him. Nobody has had the EPA visit his house uh, and declare him an enemy of the planet. Uh, uh, that, would, that is certainly something that would, that would be expected by the, uh, uh, from a democratic president. The, every agency has a SWAT team. And uh, one might easily expect these teams to be dispatched. Uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to shoot. Somebody's going to hurt somebody. And then the, the, uh, the vicious cycle would get another push. Uh, I've spoken long enough. I simply want to refer all, everyone to everyone who, 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 who doubts the notion of, uh, of where a vicious cycle can take you to Thucydides' account of the revolution at Corsaira. This is a revolution which ended up dis physically destroying the city and most of its inhabitants. In fact, nearly all of its inhabitants. And it started with ordinary garden variety political differences, which the, the, the resolution of which one side did not accept, the counter resolution of it by the other side, the other side did not accept, and the non-acceptance of, of political victories and defeats was always a little more violent than the previous one. And again, these revolutions naturally, what Thucydides, what Thucydides wrote was simply uh, a, a, a prologue to history as we know it. The nature of revolutions is that they do, they tend to become more violent as uh, uh, with every turn in, in, the, in the cycle. Uh, how do you, uh, how do we deal with this? We'll have to deal with it as best we can. The ba my basic point uh, that I made before the 2016 election is that we have entered into a revolutionary time. We have stepped over the threshold of a revolution. Events are in the saddle. We do not know what is happening, and may God help us. Well, uh, we ran over a bit, so I, I think uh, we'll forego the interpanel discussion and have a few questions, and then I'll let everyone decamp to the bar and continue to discuss. So. Yes, right down here. Please wait for the microphone. They're coming right up the aisle. How, address this to anybody on the panel, how do we avoid this litany of horrors while trying to get out of the system, let's say, somebody like a Lindsey Graham or a John McCain or Lisa Murkowski, and, not, and avoid winding up with people like Roy Moore or Sharon Angle who discredit all of us and lead to even worse results because then on top of everything else, they lose. Maybe they don't lose. Vote and hope. Do you want to respond, Michael, or we're, we'll just move on? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, way in the back there. Thank you. Uh, it seems like all of your comments <clears throat> to whether, to what degree you acknowledge the potential that we move past a civil war, all of your comments focused on the fact that there's a, a lack of moral confidence among certain segments of our population and what it means to be an American. One question I had, particularly related to the conservative side of this argument, is I've heard a lot of conservatives essentially take the position on free speech issues of wanting to avoid that exact question of saying, look, well, why, why not we just advocate for a rule that says, <clears throat> essentially, we're going to protect all forms of expression, the most disgusting, the most vile, the most outrageous, the most absurd, in the hope that that means you won't be able to restrict our speech to. I don't think that's actually borne out in fact, and I think it's inconsistent with the founders' political philosophy and the original meaning of the Constitution and the freedom of speech. 
And so I'm just wondering, how does that advance the moral confidence needed in what it means to be an American, to take a view that tries to deny principal distinctions that self-government is capable? Any takers? <laughs> well, um, uh, I agree with George F. Will that the most important words in the English language are up to a point. Um, so I think that um, the uh, I think that absolutism about anything is. Uh, is dubious, uh, so I, I agree with your the, the the thrust of your question as I understand it. I think the um, um, uh, that that both those on the right and those on the left um, are uh, favor free speech up to a point. The uh, difference is that conservatives, as the the word implies, um, want to. Um, think in terms of limits for the sake of conserving known and existing things. Um, ta um, um, the, the, the sort of moral foundations of a free society, uh, the, the existence itself, so uh, uh, sedition, uh, uh, things that would, would uh, cause the, uh, lead to the, the prospective dissolution of the society itself. Um, are not, uh, they don't, conservatives don't believe the Constitution is a suicide pact, as Justice Jackson said. Um, progressives, as the word implies, um, uh, think that the constraints on free speech um, are to be found in the progress from a benighted past to a enlightened future. So they are inclined to uh, uh, restrict speech for the sake of um, um, uh, speech that is is uh, tainted by uh, racism, that is um, um, re reflects some uh, unacceptable attitudes and, and habits of thought that that a, a good and decent society will will disabuse itself of. You may have seen uh, just I think today the story that uh, after protesters uh, prevented a speech at the, uh, I think it was at William and Mary, by the, Virgi the head of the Virginia ACLU chapter. Um, the, the chapter put out a statement condemning um, the, uh, uh, the, the protests, and then self-censored, put out a second draft of it that, that removed the, uh, the the passages in the first one about the importance of free debate, um, how at universities particularly have to be receptive to a variety of opinions. Um, in other words, the, um, at least the Virginia chapter of the ACLU is now um, so woke that it won't even um, defend its own rights, which makes it highly unlikely they'll defend anyone else's. There's a wonderful line in The Godfather where Johnny Fontaine comes and he says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? This Mr. Waltz won't give me the pod. What I, I'm perfect for him. It's perfect for me. What am I going to do? And Brando suddenly jumps up and slaps him across the face and says, you can act like a man. Yeah. Well, that's my exhortation to all of you. You can act like a man. We don't have to take this from these people. It's a cargo cult of insane lunatics with a fascist bent. They want to choke your free speech. They have this crazy notion that history bends in an arc, as articulated by our most recent ex-president. They believe in things that are impossible to believe in, that even Humpty Dumpty can't believe in these things before breakfast. So why are we taking these people seriously? The only reason we are is that they're violent and they're dangerous. And I've been dealing with these people since 1967, and I'm very tired of it. I want to lay down this burden and let you guys attack them. <laughs> Because you, the only way you stop a bully is by punching him in the face and breaking his teeth. That's how you stop a bully. The left has got to be stopped. And to use one of their favorite expressions, by any means necessary. How do you like it now? 
Mm -hmm. Michael, could you put that in the terms of, earlier you said we have the law, tradition, morality, justice on our side. It sounded like you were offering something slightly different just now. Well, I know. I think we, we, we have all those on our side, and they're the force behind the fist that goes flying right into their face. I don't think uh, the Constitution isn't a suicide pact, and we have the means to defend ourselves. And if these people want to move that violence into a, 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 you know, onto the streets, they ought to get right back what they what they're doing, and not necessarily by vigilantes, but by the force of the society we're defending. Yes, sir, right here. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, my understanding is that for several years now, uh, the most widely used American history textbook in uh, high schools is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the theme of that book uh, doesn't, uh, it, in terms of recovering the American idea is not complementary to the Claremont Institute's idea of recovering the American idea. Yeah. With um, multiple generations of young people having been educated in this fashion, uh, what does that portend for actually recovering the American <coughs> idea? Angela, we were both colleagues of Mr. Yes, Zinn we at were. Boston University. I mean, you knew him <laughs> certainly better than I. The, Howard Zinn's book is dangerous only because of the ignorance of the people who read it. Uh, where does that come from? When I was looking for schools for my kids, I always looked at the books that they were that would be assigned to them. One history book I opened at random had a picture of a woman on a horse. The woman looked a lot like Betty Friedan, <laughs> and she was swinging a lasso, and uh, underneath uh, the, the caption was, Vaquera. Supposedly, uh, the, state of, the state of California was full of vaqueros and vaqueras mm -hmm. equally. Now, uh, you, you have a genera generation of, of young people who are brought up to believe in things that simply never existed uh, and that uh, the authors of the books wished they had existed. These are, fan these are uh, history books that are, faction, that are um, uh, fiction, complete fictions. And... Um, uh, when people grow up with, uh, without any foundation of fact, of who did what, who was doing where, who, who was doing what, where, and how, without knowledge like that, then ideology uh, can, can spread easily. There's no, um, uh, there is no uh, antidote. There is no immunological resistance uh, to ideology. You see what I'm saying? Ignorance is the great enabler of such as Howard Zinn. Take one more question. Right down here, Roger. <clears throat> I'm Roger Pilon from the Cato Institute. I want to push back against the, what I take to be the excessive doom and gloom that we've heard here this evening. Uh, it seems to me that the institutions are holding more than uh, many of us may believe they are. We have seen, for example, that the uh, worst excesses of Trump have been checked uh, by people like uh, McManus and uh, Jim uh, Mattis and uh, De Betsy DeVos and some of the things that they're doing. We've seen that the worst excesses of the left have been checked by the Supreme Court and by the excesses of the left, I mean the appointees at the lower courts of Obama. And we see in the pipeline a string of soon-to-be judges and possibly justices who are deeply rooted in the principles that we all stand for. So I am not nearly as pessimistic. I see the institutions as holding. There is indeed cultural rot 
but our institutions are strong, in my judgment. I walked through the Capitol today with my partner in our new venture, and there was a series of pictures up along the walls underneath the Capitol going over from the House side to the Senate side. And every single one of the pictures, uh, they, they would have been submitted by amateur artists from around the country. They were all the different states represented. Almost without exception, the pictures were of screaming women, children, minorities. There was no one picture that represented sort of old-fashioned America. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But I, I can't emphasize enough what miserable sods these people are. Everything to them is pain and suffering and discrimination and, and uh, force majeure. At, it's, it's like there was never any freedom. You've been living in a concentration camp since 1787. And it was a little bit disconcerting for us to see this in the Capitol. There was nothing that represented the goodness of America, nothing. Everything was pain and suffering. And that just gives you a window into the mentality of the left. As I said, they're insane. So we, we don't have to take them as seriously as we do. And, and I hope the institutions do push back against this. All right. Well, well that, that was a cheery ending. Yeah, thanks, Michael. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. And please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>